the download. The Unity Indie version is a free download from unity3d.com. And hopefully you'll see that in many ways, uh, like what we're going to do is look at what we just made, stick it into Unity in the right slot, and see what happens in terms of analysis. And hopefully that'll at least take you under the hood a little bit into Unity as a 3D program and what it can do. That's the idea. So here are some instructions like how to install this stuff if you don't have it. And again, if you fall behind, don't worry. Because I think even if you just look at what's happening, you'll get the drift of how this is going to happen. The next, then we're going to look at that, put a Gephi file in there, uh, a graph file. Then we're going to say, what about, because that's all about movement. Which is, of course, one aspect of human experience of the environment. The second part of that, another significant part of that, is visibility. So we're also going to use a uh, software that was created by King's College called Depth Map X, and we're going to create a visibility graph, and we're going to stick that in the, in the Unity on the model and see what those two types of graphs, are really both graphs, you know, how they interact with that built environment. Because what's the traditional knock against space syntax is that it creates an abstract graph that is now held apart from the actual built environment and analyzed as almost an independent closed system. And you sort of lose the connection back to the actual built space. But I think these graphs can be put, Unity allows you to put them right in there and start thinking about interconnectivity that way while within the space. So that's our agenda for today. Um, okay, and so my. My own impetus for this is about a four-year-old project. Uh, is like there's a lot of art in Pompeii. <laughs> there's been a publication, an ongoing Italian publication called Pompeii, Andrea uh, that is most. I mean, it's done, and it's you know, I forget how many volumes, by ten or something like that. Uh, so we have. It's not by the way. It doesn't have all the stuff in it, but it has a lot. It's an indispensable resource. Resource. We also have Heuser and Pompeii, a German series of specific houses with uh, quite high quality you know, data in there about the houses. Uh, so if you want to start thinking about how does art and why does art get put in certain spaces within these houses, how does it behave, how does direct behavior move within those houses? That really was the question, became the question for me. So there I was, like in 2003, with my laptop, making an Excel spreadsheet and saying, okay, this piece of art is there, this piece of art is there, this piece of art. And I'm like, this is insane trying to visualize how this might have worked. This needs to be a 3D kind of database. So that's how I got started on this project. So there's some sticks up here if you want to put some, you know, if you want to follow along and you know, we're going to try that and see how it works. It's an experiment. Here you go. <laughs> okay, so that's, that was really my question. And you, you think, like, don't we really know this? And the answer is, no, we don't really know this. And there is, there's two quick answers as to why. Why is this, you know, really a big open question? One of those answers is that our traditional nomenclature for researching space in Pompeii is really inadequate in terms of the spatial description. If you say triclinium, you can maybe say dining room, even though you might like half of those rooms you never found anything to do with dining in them. Okay, so okay, they're fine. Then you say cubiculum. You don't know where that cubiculum is right next to the front door or out the back next to the garden. It's completely non-specific spatially. And so one of the problems, of course, is that system. And behind that system is a sort of assumption about the Roman house. Like it comes in an ideal form that has a falcase, a atrium, a lino garden, a symmetrical layout. And if people don't do that, well, they're low-down people trying to imitate a Roman house and fail. And so the way that works out is that most of these houses then become failures to live up to this ideal. And so to me, well, that's already difficult from a sort of critical ideological perspective. It also makes it difficult to understand the strategies of those people, because you're already approaching them as like, oh, half or three quarters of the preserved houses in Pompeii have a decorative approach that is a failure to reproduce what rich people do, you know, what real people do. So it seems to me that that was not going to be so helpful in terms of trying to get at the actual distribution of art against space in Pompeii. And this is like, you know, probably this is a very familiar set of names. And you can see right away that the cubiculum up here, the cubiculum back there, they're really in different locations spatially, but they're called the same. So if you track, what's all the artwork like in cubicula in Pompeii? Seems like a worthy question, but it's spatially really vague. So that's why uh, I was sort of driven to you know, if you look at the map, like how many of these are actually like that plan? 
vanishingly few. You know, this was pointed out in, the, I suppose, the most forceful critic on the scores with Penelope Allison about artifact finds and how we name these rooms, and there's just not a lot of support for the artifact finds, and even literature itself in which we get these names, there's not a lot of attestations, which means definitions of problem, all that stuff. Okay? So, okay, what should we do then, Penelope? Penelope comes up with some uh, some descriptive categories, rather cumbersome names, like the left hand wing, left hand room off the first courtyard kind of names. Also, in a sense, not statistical. And so I thought maybe a good thing to do with Pompeii would be to actually collect and analyze spatial data. Like that. that would be really helpful in this. And so what kind of spatial data would we collect? Hence, I started thinking about space syntax, and I certainly was not the first person to do so. There's a 2000 publication by Mark Graham. There's a, let's see, there's a Janet Delane publication on Austria that uses some stuff from Pompeii. Uh, Ray Lawrence, so I'll give you a bibliography or slide in just a second. So I'm certainly not the first to do that, but what we're going to, from my standpoint, traditional space syntax, as it comes out of University College London, has now, and this has emerged over time, some significant weaknesses compared to like, uh, an approach gone from more mainstream network to policy, which we're going to look at. Okay, we're going to focus on one little house. Why are we focusing on this house? Because I've modeled it in it is in no way like well, because it's super representative of every house in Pompeii. That's not true. It's super representative of what I've been working on. And so we're going to look at that. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's good enough to see the kind of methodology that's possible with these tools. Okay, so that's the location of where we're headed. And that's our little house. You know, it's modest. In a sense, it is one of those, you know, lower middle class failures to live up to the upper class ideal has a sort of smallish garden, like a sort of couple, three columns, that's their portico. Uh, I guess that room is it's a gleam if you must have one, that's it. Okay, so it doesn't really fit the nomenclature and layout of the ideal house, and, but we can nonetheless analyze it using these tools. Okay, so instead of analyzing how it fails to like reflect that plan. Okay, so here is a uh, quick bibliography of some key publications in space syntax, not only from Pompeii, but more broadly from classical theology. So that's that. And I'm going to look at a few of these examples, because they've used, I think, space, and to me, there's been some very productive uses of it. I just sort of want to tweak it towards more mainstream metrics, because I think they can help us. Okay, so this is a Janet Delane did a great article on uh, Medianum apartments in Austin using space syntax. She also, and, and you know, to her credit, and I know other people have done this as well, but the traditional criticism against space syntax is that it looks only at space. Space is a machine that really is the driver of human motion and behavior within the built environment. Like, what about decoration? What about, for instance, doorway width? What about maybe even doorway height or ceiling height? And Delane took some of these into account and, you know, trying to work out a, a formal description of any on apartments. And in her case, the terminology for apartment space in Austria was even worse than it is for houses in Pompeii, even more poorly adjusted. Okay? So she did that, and you can see what happens here is this particular space gets broken out, and there's your, your outside space, your street, and everything is justified relative to that. And so you get a, a J graph that orients everything to the outside streets, and it's very concerned with like the level of depth of each room. So it doesn't matter that in terms of actual space, this is right next to the street. And say room seven is way past the atrium. They get put on the same level. Uh, because that's what's driving space syntax, the traditional space syntax, it's interest in this. That they lie at the same uh, depth from the outside carrier. And to me, that is a, depth is a significant consideration, but you shouldn't let that overwhelm where they are you know, in terms of actual space. So that's why we're going to use a somewhat different methodology. Uh, and Kevin Fisher has also used space syntax to a lot of effect in analyzing uh, palaces on uh, Cyprus. And note that he's taken space syntax and built into edges and labels and markers a much richer sort of set of information that you get from the traditional J graph. And so one of the, I think, the key step forward from traditional space syntax was something like this, that used the J-graph to, to line up things like elaboration of doorway entrances. Uh, so it's not just the fact of the edge, but it's elaboration that becomes important to analyzing how space works. 
And to me, that was, oh, okay, yeah, that's really, really important. So how can we, how can we get at that and also start to consider space both abstractly and within its context? Okay? So the first thing to do is create a graph. And I don't know how much graphing theory or awareness there is in the room, but this is the basic part of it for, for a space syntax approach or network topology approach. Because each room is going to become a node, each doorway an edge. And so what you do is just put in the nodes and the edges and connect them. And that's what we're going to do first. And you can see that we're already, in some ways, I've already done something different than, for instance, Delaney did. And that is the atrium has been split into four nodes rather than one. And I think that's really important. Because that central impluvium is really quite an obstacle to movement, not to vision, but to movement. If you filled it in and extended it skyward, you would definitely have a four-sided situation there. So in my opinion, we ought to respect that, because it's a deflector of physical motion. So uh, in our approach, what we're going to do today is go ahead and subdivide the that parasol will be treated the same. Okay? So that's one thing that's not been done in most space syntax studies of Pompeii, is to let's resolve the atrium and the pump and the peristyle into multiple spaces rather than one. And this sort of violates the traditional diplom of space syntax, the fewest and the fattest uh, convex spaces. But I think I'm willing to violate that to get at a more accurate map of how people might move in the space. And so you can see that this is a directed graph. You start here and you make your way in. And it, you don't, it's like you pour water in the top and it flows downhill you know, into the various spaces. And you don't reverse that. So to me, this is a crude, I think there's a lot of development and improvement that can be made to this. This is sort of a crude representation of the outsider's perspective on the space. Because right? you're in, where are you going to go within that space? Which pathway are you going to follow? Obviously, if this is your resident space, then you're not, you, you, know, you might want to go from here to the top right corner or from any other node to any other node. That would be an undirected graph. And both perspectives are important because in their differences, a directed graph versus undirected, they sort of rough and ready you know, reflect inhabitant versus stranger. Okay, so we're just, and now that, you know, we're almost done with the theoretical intro. And if you were interested in loading software, hopefully that's happened. Uh, and this is just saying, okay, now it's undirected. Now by putting two-way arrows on every node, on every edge, okay, any person at any node can go to any other node within the system. Now, you have to if you reflect a little bit, that's not really true inside Roman houses, we don't think, in terms of social history. You know, so it's, it's a little bit of a simplification, but it's already more explicit than what happens in space syntax, traditional space syntax, okay? So, to make one of these graphs, uh, yeah, we have a little bit about visibility graphs. I think both are important. Right? And there's been a really great application of more traditional space syntax and visibility graph by, I think it's uh, Johanna Steger uh, had a piece on, a dissertation on Ostia, where she combines the two together. Not really concerned about art placement, because there's not a lot of art preserved um, in her in that particular uh, structure she's looking at in Ostia, but it's still a really nice combination of these two methodologies to get a more comprehensive view of how space works. And so we're going to generate, generate both of these graphs and then dump them into this 3D plan and see what happens. Okay, but first, I think it's good for you to see, even if you, you may fall behind, that's okay, but just to see how these two pieces of software, which are uh, Gephi, which is going to do the space syntax and network topology part, and DefMap, which is going to do this part. And what's happened here, as we'll see, is that we've just put a dense little grid of squares on top of the architecture, and seeing which little squares can see which other little squares, given the interference of the architecture of the built space. And therefore, some, some of these spaces have a lot more visual emphasis than others of these spaces. And that's where we say, well, is that significant relative to the placement of art in the space? And can, can get at developing statistics about that. Okay, so the first thing you do is to create the graph. And so what I'm going to do is switch over and I'm going to invite you guys, with some trepidation, to go ahead and launch Gephi. And it should look something like this we do. And if you don't, that's OK. This is the program that we're going to create our nodes and edges in. And it's just going to be a quick, quick <laughs> introduction to it. Uh, and then we're going to perform some really basic analyses you know, on that graph that we've created. OK, you ready? OK, so does it? 
people who are interested, is this open for you? Indicate by saying yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. Awesome. Now, here's the drag about Gephi, because it's like designed for social network analysis, you know, Facebook interactions and things like that. It doesn't have like, I want to put a background image in it. It's not like do spatial analysis with social network analysis tools. Forget it. They haven't, like I talked about it about two years ago, it hasn't happened. So we're going to do a really super kludgy workaround for that situation. And here's, for Mac users, here's the kludgy workaround. You want to go ahead and put in, I don't even know how to put it in an application, but launch this thing that called Overlay. It's in your Mac thing, your Mac folder and software. It's called Overlay. And I already got it fired up. And I'm going to show you the window now. I told you it was kludgy and it is. Because that's not my, right, that's my built space. So I'm going to do is throw in a bunch of nodes over here and then drag them to where they go. And I'm going to draw edges between them and step. It's really visual and simple. And it's, to me, it's much more instructive than like typing in the code that could generate this graph. Okay? Okay. So let me, have you opened the overlay the Mac users out there? How do you do that? You just take it, you go to your software folder, and in their software folder there should be a thing called overlay. Double click on the overlay. Overlay Mac software? Mm hmm? Is it in Overlay demo? Or yeah, overlay demo is good. But should be a disk image. Okay, yeah, that launched, but what do you need to get that into? Oh, okay, now that's an excellent question. What you got to do to get that into the little window, right? Because you'd like to have the image in there, correct? Check. Okay, now let me, we got some Windows users over here. Right on. Now, I really apologize for this part. There is an embarrassing piece of software for you guys that's called Always on Top. <laughs> So you want to open <laughs> always on top. Now it's actually a handy thing because it, it, like once you've got that running, you can control click on any window and it will always be on top. How handy is that? Almost like they could have built that into. Like that's such a handy thing. Anyhow, where do I find always on top? With a Mac, you won't. It won't work. Okay. Yeah. So don't worry about that. You, yeah. Mac is on the bottom. So, but, but what you want to do, once you've opened this thing, once you have open always on top of your next duty on the window side is to go in and open this thing called transparency. It's in your Windows software. Is it in there? Your Windows software folder? Tell me what's the contents of your folder. Really fast. Four by reference utility, space group UCL, always on top, get me JRE7. Oh, shit. Yep. That wasn't what I was hoping to hear, man. It went by fast, though. I admire that. <laughs> I just got the number for Okay. Not fair. I'm not seeing that overlay. So what the heck happened there, guys? Um, imagine it's there. You go forward. So, Windows users, imagine you're looking at this. And you can probably, actually, you can just do this and get the eyeball in it. You'll be close enough. You know, once we see this, sorry about that. I must have forgot. But at least you get the free always on top. And so um, what we're going to do now is create, like, we're not going to worry a lot about this interface, which threatens to be confusing. Is what we're going to do is just click on it like that. And we're going to maybe, maybe we have to start a new project. Maybe once that to happen. See, now when I started a new project, it lit up all the buttons and stuff so I could do stuff in this program. I still don't know where the picture file is. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Where you got to go to get the overlay picture is if you go over to um, your overlay demo, go file, open. Got that? Up in your top left for your overlay. If you click on the overlay window, good. Okay. Open that up and navigate to the thing you dragged over into the images folder. Good? Wait. You should have dragged over a Mac thingy and in there was yeah, an image. Images, yeah. Okay. In that images thing, there's something called blah blah blah, blah cropped Gephi. You want to open that one. And then you're going to need to resize it a little bit. And I warn you, this is when overlay likes to crash. I told you it's kludgy. It's an open world, open software world, how, how we roll. And so you can resize it to get it close to this size. And again, if you're not getting, like, if it's being finicky, don't worry. Just, just to demonstrate the principle. Is it getting pretty close? Yeah. You just need a little working space out here to work with the nodes. Okay, now we're going to create our nodes that are going to make this graph. Okay, so I'm going to run down like this. Move, this stuff is about moving your nodes about. 
like that. This is about creating them and resizing them now on this side. So I'm going to hover over that little guy and say, oh, little guy. Oh, because I'm an overlay, so it's like, I'm not listening to you. Right there, huh? node pencil. That looks handy. Let's click on node pencil. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to think reflectively for a second and go, okay, I need like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 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 like sixteen or seventeen nodes, right? Because each room is a node and each door is an edge. So I'm going to start thinking about that and say the street has to be a node. So I'm going to start with that. So I'm going to click over here and go street node. I'm going to say, Jesus, Geffy, what a minuscule node. What? what? We'll resize them in a second so you can like, see them. Do you see that tiny dot? Uh, anyhow. So we're going to go, OK, foul case. One side of the atrium, the north side of the atrium south side of the atrium. Because I'm splitting into four parts or I'm including it. That side of the atrium. Then this room that flanks the foul case. This room that flanks the foul case on the other side. Then we got like two rooms and then a little latrine over here. So this looks like a kitchen area. Huh? Then we got E and F. And so then over here we got like L. We got like I and uh, K. And a little tiny room and then M. And then the garden space. See how I did that? Just like clicking where I know there's rooms. Like each, like if you think of each letter, put your node on top of like over to the side. Imagine, because you can't click through the overlay window. Yeah. That's retarded. Like they give you overlay, but you can't click through it. Why else would you want it? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I just made a little I, a facsimile in nodes of where the letters are over there. You see how that worked? Now I'm just gonna drag them over. Okay, and then we're gonna start analyzing like crazy. Okay, so first things first, I'm going to drag my nodes over. You know, and I, maybe I should resize them. Let's resize them because they're annoying in this tiny format. So you can click on the box and drag it around your nodes, just like that. Okay, and they've been selected, though you don't think they have. <laughs> okay, and then I'm going to click on Mr. Little Diamond like there. That says make them bigger or small. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to drag in, and the nodes grow. It's really awesome. Okay, so now I can actually see them, which is a tremendous benefit. So I'm going to click on the hand, <laughs> I'm click on the hand tool, and then I'm going to drag them over. And I got just enough space over on this edge to get my street node over there, right? Did I actually get it? No, it's being cranky. Let me click on this first, and then click on that, and then try. Oh, now I'm good. Now I can click and drag it over there. Huh? So there's my street. You good? Now I'm going to do like this and drag. This over it's on top of B. Oh, is it going to be cranky? If yeah. all of the nodes disappear. Yeah, when they disappear, you've actually selected one. I know it's disconcerting, guys. I don't guys. see a single node. Can they scroll down a view or is there something? Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even getting nodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's a no okay. Okay. Because nothing's happening when I click on mine. Okay. And that's why we can't worry too much, right? Because yeah. if you fall behind, it's OK. Because you just an open source software. You can download it and take a little longer. You have the map right there, the plan right there. As long as you follow along with what's being done in concept, it's not too hard. But it's real more the visual poorness of this software. Rather than it's just like its interface, I'm getting that. But like the nodes disappear, what the hell is happening? And they're tiny to begin with. So I'm going to just go ahead and drag my nodes over. So if you get behind, just follow, because we just don't have a lot of <coughs> So what I've done here is confuse myself about where I am. Oh, that must be this side. Yeah, so I'm putting that guy there. And pretty soon, you'll see that I have nodes all right here. Uh, on the surrounding the conclusion, those flanking either falcate, either uh, cubicle on either side of falcates. And then I'm going to pull this guy over here to be, I guess that's G. That is H. And this guy gets like the little latrine. It's obviously a convex space, albeit a little one, but it gets so I'm going to call that. Oh, okay, that's another node, it really is. And so I'm going to put E in there and F in there. And again, it's kind of clunky, like dragging on things. Uh, and so now I suppose I need this guy over here. And he's a major distributor right? over on this side. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So, yeah. Okay, and all this is doing is creating a network of nodes that matches the actual layout of the house, which I think is actually more handy than the traditional J-graph in many ways. So now I put all my nodes. You saw that work? So I draw the nodes over and stick them in the rooms. And I, now I got them in pretty much the right layout, which is significant. Okay? 
And now what I'm going to do is hide this guy right here. I'm going to go to my overlay window and just hide it. Knows that that's my layout of nodes. Now what else do I need? Come on, stay with me, guys. <laughs> Edges, right? And we're going to go with directed for, for our purposes right now. You would want to rerun this with undirected to get a complete set of maps to sort of do your analysis. But we'll stick with directed right now. So I'm going to click on that to make sure that's on. And then I'm going to click on my this is edge pencil. OK, and saying select a source node. And I'm going to obey. You know, I'm going to select a source node right there. It's going to say select a target node. I'm going to do so. And I'm going to do so. Show me my damn yeah. There we go. So all I did was slide the slider, you know, to get the edge to show up. And so there are, I mean, this is by, by no means a perfect, and this is why I, I should have really done this part. Huh? Let's make it directed. But not to work. So now what I'm going to do is maybe uh, just go on drawing my stuff. Select a source node. You have to go in to the source node. And then uh, are you selecting it? Uh, do select the source node. So it's real finicky that way. And so then I'm going to go, and you can see, and this, I like this process a lot, because you're forced to think about you know, which nodes connect to which nodes. And probably, you know, if you've worked on a house for a little while, you get a sense of like, how traffic flow is to work. So I'm going to just collect, connect these up. And it's pretty straightforward. And it is, though this has been kind of cranky, like that. Sorry, I don't want to go from there now, so sorry about that. But it's good. Um, so, at the end of the day, though, you've created a graph. Okay? And I'm going to go ahead and type it and put in the rest of these, and we'll see what kind of analyses we can perform. Because this is where the action is in Gephi once you get your, once you get your nose all hooked up. And I think I've made some mistakes, but it's okay. Uh, that's another app. But we're going we're gonna to continue on and see what we get. And hopefully you can get the principle behind this, which is more important. It's being really finicky about selecting the target nodes. It's not seeing the nodes. Okay, that's true. Okay, that's fine. Yep, won't do it. Oh, okay, that's gonna, this is, we're going to get some really faulty, but I've saved the correct graph, so not to worry. <laughs> Because it's, it, we're going to get some really faulty analyses out of this, but it's okay. It is all far. Now it's happy. Now it's what it's called. Sorry, no. That. Okay. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of measurements it, it would do. Okay, so we've got some things, nodes that reverse, and so it's, we're going to get some faulty outcomes, but. The principles to me are more important, and that is over here on the right-hand side, you have a couple of major things you can do. And the most important and first one to do is average path length. And if you're familiar with uh, space syntaxes terminology, then you've maybe heard words like uh, integration, uh, asymmetry, real relative asymmetry, a kind of vocabulary that's just not shared in the wider world of network analysis, but is used in space syntax. These do very similar things, not the same things exactly, but very similar things and conceptually are useful sometimes more so. And so when you click on this and you want it to run an average path link, it's going to tell you, well, do you want it to be directed or undirected? And it's saying, you have so messed up your undirected, you must be undirected. I obey. And so uh, undirected is fine because the concepts, these are the key ones, closeness and <coughs> especially these two, closeness and closeness. Because between us is simply going to designate a node through which you have to go through a lot to get to the other nodes. And closeness is going, to, is going to identify a node that on average has the shortest path lengths to the other nodes. So these are, tend to be very highly integrated distributor nodes within the system. And so that's very good to know. So I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, Giffy, let's run that. It's going to create a graph and it's going to do it like that. Awesome. You're like, nothing happened. <laughs> or you're looking at this and saying, how do I know? that something happened from this graph. Well, the key thing there is to actually take, and this is what I like about GIF, I mean, it's a little cranky, but these are nice tools if you want to visualize the outcomes of the things that you've run. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a ranking now, like between the centrality, just like that. 
And now you can see, oh, okay, it's going to tell me some stuff if I could drag this a little bit <coughs> to the side. I can choose a color right there, and so, you know, I'm going to have to lose a little bit of my graph, and I'll pull it back over. Because it's not liking the screen size, I think I'm going to a little bit too. That. Maybe I'll grab all my nodes. Nah, just one at a time, that's fine. So what I'm going to do then is say, between a centrality, this color system is fine by me. I can also control the size that, they, that the nodes get represented at and apply. Oh, okay. So now it's highlighting those nodes that have a high between the centrality, and I can also color them. And so I can start to get some visual feedback, and I can say, looking at this system, now it's an undirected graph, a messed up graph. I can say that, oh, okay, it's still actually reflecting a lot of reality about this house. But I've misdrawn some of the edges, and that is, look at the atrium as a distributor, and especially this node. And I like this a lot of analyzing Pompeii and houses. It's telling us that this node is really the on node of the atrium. It's not just one thing. The node at the, on the north end is getting very little action, according to Geffy's analysis. This node's getting a lot. Okay, this node's getting a lot. It's a major distributor around the garden. And those things can now be put in a table and kept track of. And so you want to say, I want to see every, like, every node that's high between the centrality in this range of houses. That can be a very powerful thing to track in terms of spatial analysis. The other key thing I like about this, and we'll just stick with between the centrality for now, because we've got to sort of switch over to VGA here in just a second, is that, okay, I see which nodes I'm going to have to go through a lot to get to my destination in this house. What are my likely destinations? And this is not something traditional space syntax will consider a lot. Okay? Because it's saying these are the nodes that matter. These are the where people are going to interact. That's a sort of built-in assumption to its methodology. And I'm not so sure. And the reason I kind of like this port, this type of network topology is, is, for instance, what if you were navigating the web? The hub page is not where you want to end up. It's a distributor. That's not my endpoint. The knowledge I seek is not on that distributor page, but further down the chain. And the key concept there is eigenvector centrality, which once I sort of like, oh, oh, yes, the eigenvector centrality, what the hell is that? So I'm like reading network theory and going, oh, oh, okay, that's like where the information is. And it's like, oh, that's where the high end wall page is. Let's try that. That's like a hypothesis you can test. So, as, you know, especially in directed graphs of these houses, it became really an interesting thing to follow. And it's the eigenvector centrality is the basis for it. I'm going to pull this over, pull this out, because I'm working with a tiny screen space. Pull this back over, so we can get that going on. Okay, you see down here eigenvector centrality. What that measures is not the centrality of a node in terms of having lots of edges coming into it. Like, it's not between us. It's not necessarily that you have a lot of connections to you. It's that the, the edges, and maybe only one, but the edge that leads to you goes through other highly connected nodes. So you may be in relative isolation at the edge of the graph, but the next node to you, the next node to that, the next node to that, those nodes are really well integrated. And therefore, the power of their connections passes to you. And to me, that's like, wow, that could be a predictor, a really interesting predictor of like elaboration within rooms, and one that hasn't been tested. So if we run eigenvector centrality, you'll see things are going to change considerably in terms of the visualization. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and well, I can switch colors over here so maybe you can see the map and apply. And you can see not much change at all because this is an undirected graph, so that's kind of disappointing. So let's try size, maybe that'll happen. Nope. Oh, that's between still. So, ah, that's one. So we got to note that. I would like it to default switch to the one, the one that I just ran, but nope. You got to go in and choose. So if you apply, you can see oh, certain things change pretty markedly in terms of eigenvector centrality. If this was a directed graph, that is, if I hook my edges up correctly, these guys at the end will be very large, and that's how we'll see them inside the house. Okay. So ones that were small for between us suddenly become quite large for eigenvector because they're connected to these well-connected atrium and, and uh, like this little peristyle node. Are you all following this? So I think that's, and to me it's like, well, okay, we can then track what rooms are at what depth with what eigenvector centrality, but between this centrality and we also throw closeness into that mix and, and start to categorize rooms in those bins 
and then ask what art is in those bins. Okay, and that's one kind of really powerful way of interrogating space in Pompeii. And at this point, we can say, well, that's like it's a 2D way still. Okay, here's the thing: we don't have to get too deep in this, but if you go into preview and hit refresh, then you get a graph you can export as a PNG. And once I got that PNG, I'm like, that's a texture in Unity. I can stick that right on the floor and see how that happens, and see how that looks <coughs> in the space in 3D. So that's so not to belabor this, but what I, what I my workflow would be to export this, use it as a PNG texture, maybe edit a little Photoshop, might be a little out of whack, stick it on the floor. It's that simple. Stick it on the floor in Unity and walk on that floor. And now I know, well, I'm in a well-connected zone right now. I'm moving, like in terms of between the centrality, I'm moving to one with high eigenvector centrality. What's happening on the walls around me as I do that? Okay, now the next part is now we're going to switch gears because we got, man, we're on a schedule. Okay, so what I'm going to do is quit Gephi with that rapid introduction. But actually, this, the, the software is still kind of clunky, but the community and the help is really good. And so if you just go to their site, if you decide you're interested in like a quick way into network topology mapping, this is a really pretty good site to do so. The next one is more difficult in terms, not in terms of use, in fact, it might even be easier. So we're gonna open that now, and I know there's like, oh God, the last thing didn't work, so, but it's gonna be fine. So what we're gonna do now, and I'm, I'll navigate there with you, so I'm gonna go to my own location for these things. You have them on your desktop, probably. Uh, so I'm gonna go through this rather labyrinthine graph to get to what I'm gonna do. And so, we'll see what happens now. I'm going to Mac, software, and I'm going to go to this guy. Do y'all follow that? Okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open releases. You'd think you'd open depth map X, no, it's releases. Then that one, and finally, there we go, there's the app. With a tremendously high eigenvector centrality. <laughs> Way now. Way down where the information was. Okay, awesome. I'm going to double click that. And it's going to say, okay, here's what's going to happen for you now. Hit OK. And did you crash? Did you crash on it? You get something that looks like that. Okay? Isn't that helpful? <laughs> Nothing helping for you? Did it work? Oh, no, it just crashed, so I'll just watch. Oh, okay, yeah. It crashed but, three times. I, yeah, you know, I give it three this, times. This piece okay. of software is really. In, it's not stable at all. In I fact, I'm no longer supporting it. I'm not kidding. This has been one of the, the most handy tools for this kind of visibility graph analysis, and it's really getting cranky. So what we're going to do is build our own script, our own way of doing this within Unity, on, based on the same principles. And hopefully it won't crash on mine, but it might well. Okay, so, but the principles are almost more important than the application right here. And I have a graph I can use inside the house in the case. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go File, New. And there's a little bit of a trick here, because you've got to put some kind of image in it for it to work with, like a, like a, a DXF or a, like an AutoCAD thing of the floor plan. And it's going to work with that to generate the visibility graph. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it's really not too many steps. It's pretty straightforward, if unfortunately unstable. So what I'm going to do is go to my map and hit import. And I've got to find my resources now, so uh, I'm assuming I've got some kind of Something like that. No, I don't want to be there. There's my stuff here. Maybe it's up here at the top. There we go. Same thing, I'm going to go into images. And my second image is this DXF, which is a trace of the floor plan. I'm going to open that up. And you can see that's the trace of the house. Right? You recognize that from before. So now what I'm going to do is say, OK, I'm not interested so much in nodes, big fat nodes as ends of movement and the edges between them, as I am in what you can see from where, in the visual, like, visual integration of different pieces of the house. And I, this, to me, I, I kind of like the workflow in here. It's very straightforward. Uh, you, you've got that sitting there. And if you want to generate a, a little grid, you can choose how big your grid is. And I'm going to choose something fairly small. Because if you go too small, it crashes all the time. So I'm going to go to point one and say, oh, let's try that, man, and see what happens. And see, it's just generated this tight little grid of squares. And I'm just going to say, OK, select everything that's not the architecture and fill it. OK, we're going to see what happens. So with that, you go uh, hopefully over to here. And you see standard fill. And I'm like, that's awesome. Let's do a standard fill. Uh, let's do a standard fill. Great. And there you go. So now it's, it's all set to say analyze. 
because it's got this space that it's like the negative reverse out of the actual bill walls. And it's going to see what of these little squares can see which other little squares, given that situation. So I'm going to go to its tools and go visibility, make visibility graph, and I'm going to just pray to God that this works. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's like 50% of your experience <laughs> with this software. Okay. But I'm not gonna I'm not, I'm not worrying at all. Because I already did this and saved out these files. So now we're gonna imagine that you remember that colorful one we saw like towards the end? That's that one. Okay? So this is uh it's all it's all good. So we're gonna go to a piece of software that crashes relatively less often. Okay, and that's Unity. And what we've got going on in Unity is basically a model, a built model of this house. And the sort of premise, what I, what, I, what I think is really helpful about this <coughs> is I can have this pretty elaborate. And don't, the gray smear on the floor, that's going to be, that's going to receive my graphs. Okay, I'm just going to dump them on there as a texture and control their transparency, and it's going to be awesome. And so if I look around inside the space, that's my model, huh? the house. So if you wonder, because many of you have probably never seen this house. It's actually quite well preserved for a house in Pompeii. It's in pretty good shape. And so you can see that's the atrium, and we got that little tablina, tablinum ish e, and then S behind that, and we got this sort of kitchen latrine situation to the right. And then we got like a floor that consists of gray nothingness. We're going to stick our stuff on that and see what happens. So, what I'm going to do is go over here to environmental modeling, right over here, and pick something like directed between the centrality, just like that. Okay? I'm going to slide that over and say, well, Maybe I could put a new texture on that and see what happens. So I'm going to go into my textures over here in Unity and say maybe I want my BC directed to be right on top of that guy, right like that. And there you can see our graph that we generated right on the floor. And it's like it's between us, so you can tell that, okay, that's fine. These are two very frequently like, big travel nodes of the atrium. That's the off node of the atrium. That's the far node that's going into. So you can see once you get to E, it's not a high traffic situation there. Only F lies about beyond it. And if you want to have a little more satisfying visual experience with this, what you can do is just change your shape. And partly, I'm doing this on purpose. I know this is like, what the hell is he doing? What I'm getting at is that Unity is something that we can use. Um, and it has a lot of nice qualities to it. <laughs> what the hell is that quality in this kitchen? What's nice about that? Oh, I know what's going on, I just said. What's going on there is it's become transparent, but these other guys must be on. So let me make sure they're off. Here. Make sure I got something like that. Yeah, that's what's going on. Let me turn that one off. And now you can see that you can have a pretty fun experience inside this house if you hit play. You drop into the house, there are your nodes. You can navigate around it and just at a glance get your network relations right there expressed in the space itself, which I find really useful in that, okay, what kind of space do I have here? It's a high traffic space. What kind of decoration am I getting? You can see it's quite subdued. Whereas I get farther deeper into the house, my, my elaboration is getting, or the decoration is getting considerably more elaborated. And you can then swap that same situation out for the eigenvector centrality, for instance, and put that on the floor and see how that would affect, you know, okay, as I rise, and it's true in this house, as you rise in eigenvector centrality, the decorative elaboration tends to go up, with one exception. And, that, and this, I think, points to one flaw in the methodology for sure. As we go back into this area, the kitchen is kind of grungy, it's really rough back in here, where the latrine is, <laughs> you know? And so you're back in here, and you can see that the, like your betweenness centrality is quite low. You're getting little tiny, tiny dots. If we went to eigenvector, they'd be really, really big. And you'd find a situation where E and F have very high eigenvector centrality. G and H have very high eigenvector centrality. One's really elaborately decorated. The other's a toilet. <laughs> What's the deal? That's why we're going to also put the other graph in there, right? Because I think what we need is both network topology and visibility graph, and see how those two work together. So what I'm going to do is just uh, hit escape and stop playing this thing. And uh, go ahead and turn off maybe that particular layer right there. The this and say, oh, I don't need that anymore. I think I need to turn on the VGA layer just like that. And if wall is gray again, I'll switch out my texture. See, I told you, I was worried that it might crash. And so I saved one over here. I'm just going to drop that on there. And there's our visibility. 
We can do the same thing with this shader, just change that to transparent, diffuse, and it's like its own weird code that actually makes sense and it looks like it's pretty transparent. So now we can hit play. And I think this is really cool. And you could have them both on at the same time if you want. Is that here we can see that's a major, like this is a visibility, like you can see, that's a big cone of visibility right there. And that's a main drag in terms of visibility of the house right there. If you go to right here and there, you're getting hailed by some pretty significant objects. Like the, you can see through that broad window, like I don't think the width of that window is an accident. I think it's highlighting, you know, the Lorari back in there and saying, look, look, look. And as you go, I actually think the frame with that door, I'm like, why do they make this major node or edge, the doorway into the peristyle is so small. And I think they're doing it on purpose to frame that picture of Dionysus on the wall. So you can frame, 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 and there's Dionysus, that major like visual landmark. It's got high saliency back there. And Romans do this, all, uh, Pompeians do this all the time. And so I don't think the small, comparatively small size of that could have made it a lot larger, but the tightening of that up is drawing your attention down this major visual axis of the house, right like that. And here's a room with comparatively high eigenvector centrality, the most well-decorated in the house back here. And this room is just spectacular in this tiny little house. So I found this to be really the combination of these tools in the 3D space to be really, really helpful to me. Now, um, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. We're getting pretty close to time. Uh, so what I'm going to do is now turn this off, turn off the floor a bit right here, uh, the VGA and talk a little bit about the sort of wider pedagogical implications, sort of taking a, a turn away from uh, statistical analysis of houses. Is that once built, because all I wanted, really wanted to do was get the artifact up on the wall. Then it became this kind of obsessional thing. And I started teaching classes, getting students like to get the software skills to put the artifact up on the walls. And so we're starting to get pretty finished representations of these houses. It's not simple. And all, oh, that was it, the methodological problem. You probably saw it. Okay, boy, eigenvector centrality is getting huge. Is this not an edge? <laughs> it looks like an edge to me, right? <laughs> Look at that ladder. It probably goes somewhere. Huh? We know there's a ladder there. And I was like, let's throw that out. That's inconvenient. You know, second story is, ah. <laughs> right. And so that's right. And that's a real problem to me. Because if I'm thinking about, well, what the hell is up there? We know there was a second story. Let's, we should go up there right now. And it's going to be a bumpy ride because I should put a little... <laughs> I should put, but it's cool, you know, I should put um, a little slope on there, like a little invisible glider so you could just climb up there. It's, look at that, what, what is going on? You have to have some kind of corridor, there has to be a circulation space. I'm thinking, back in here, you are looking over the train and kitchen, right there, that's, your, that's where that window opens up. I'm like, I'm in, there's also a downpipe. I'm thinking there's a second story in the train up there, but it's a hypothesis, right? Meanwhile, if you go down and you navigate your way out of this tiny little space, very small, little Romans, and go into, oh, wait, this is really cool. It's all made up, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but what all it's reflecting is that if you look out the window, well, that's much more high quality space. Like, what are they doing up there? They're going to take this view over the garden and treat it the same way decoratively as the view over the latrine. Doubtful. Right? And so how do we start to think about second stories, given that we can now model them in this level of detail? I think it pushes hypothesis forward that way, because you can do it. You know, and, and undergraduates can do it if you make them cry. And so, <laughs> and so if I go up, then I'm really now thinking about, what was that? What are, that makes this stairway really interesting. Who's going up it? Because if they are, they have to go to this relatively crappy part of the house to get to it. So I, to me, that's like a puzzle. I got a second story space that ought to be nice and awesome. It looks out over the garden. I got a stair coming down into a pretty crappy part. And who's using that stair? There's also this other room that looks down. That must be a high traffic. That, I would think that would be a lot of between the centrality for that little ladder-like stair. Who's bumping into each other on that stair? To me, that's, that, I really like that part about using 3D software together with these spatial analysis tools because it, it invites you into those kinds of questions. Okay, and now for the last sort of part of this, what I'm going to do is show you another house with a different intent. Uh, and what I'm going to do is open, uh, well, this is such a small thing, sorry, I can slide this over, something like that. We'll open this one. This is a Unity app, a standalone app. 
and we can go ahead and run it like that. And this is what I decided to do. So I was building these really finished, fairly finished compound houses. Let's use one of them as the locus for a mythology game. And this is the house of Octavius Cordio. Um, and students have worked really hard on this. So I like student built that room. I think that's awesome. You know, and so a lot of the stuff in here I'm feeling pretty good about as a playable environment. But that's, you can see, well, there's a lot of educational use once you have this kind of immersive scenario. You can teach mythology, like, like to, and you don't have to follow the rules. Like, you can make stuff up that's plausible. And so for me, teaching mythology, what would be really handy is if we could tie some of that mythology in a library <coughs> in with the Roman calendar. So let's just stick the calendar on the wall. It happens, you know, it's not all that implausible. And so that can be really handy. Uh, and there's some weird shading. Uh, you know. Mostly I'm satisfied with how this house is looking. You can really dramatize what kitchens were like. You can have students research and build all this stuff. And they'll really take it seriously. You can pull graffiti out of, put it right on the wall. And students have to think about what it means. <laughs> Fun stuff like that and like that, all of it from Pompeii. Uh, and all of it, you know, pretty close in context in terms of fine context to the kind of space I'm sticking it in here. And the idea in this myth game is to have a sub game or sort of Easter eggs where the kids have to connect the myth but, or, the, or the graffiti together thematically with what's happening in a much larger game. So this sort of integrated teaching of mythology, <coughs> including recipes. So we've put some effort in developing kitchen sort of accoutrements that are going to work to convey mythology. For instance, a fennel ball stuffed with peppered yolk. I think you could take it in that. And so that's sort of uh, the scenario for developing this further. And this house is a challenge because it's just incredibly rich in terms of water, uh, mythological decoration. So to me, this is just, uh, it's really exciting to me to be able to start to even do this and to have students participate in it and they'll if they're building this kind of environment they will learn you know, they're highly motivated especially if they know other students will play their environment so i found that to be really effective in certain terms of teaching strategy so there's both i think a serious research component to this in terms of network topology and that side of things but also really serious pedagogical interest and yep if you're thinking about gardens and roman gardens which are traditionally pretty understudied all of this, like this ivy, well, that's pretty good. I'm okay with it. The rest of these trees, it's bullshit. <laughs> you know, they're like trees made to decorate shopping malls. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, I didn't, there's no cypresses in the action pack from whatever. <laughs> and so what's missing, you know, that's something that's really sort of key is how can we start to decorate these with plants that are accurate? What happens if we start to use different positioning of those plants to choreograph the garden? Because these guys did. It's a real elaborate garden. I think its plantings are careful. And we should, like, if you go down, if it's just like, we can jump, like, with the ship, go real fast. Like, the, this, the remains of this stuff was found out here. And it's really commanding this view onto this. The statue bases, unfortunately, were found empty. But it still is sort of commanding little spot that looks right out over this nice fountain feature. How is it framed in by plants? What happens if we change that framing? Because we can do all this in virtual space and test hypotheses about gardens as much as we test hypotheses about second stories. And I guess that there's a couple things going on there. Students are involved in a very hands-on way. Areas that have been traditionally overlooked in Pompeian studies, you can start to, you can overlook them. You have to go there. What would they like? How much can we know? And so to me, this is a really powerful tool for bringing these questions forward. So that's what I got for today. And thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, um, things like the fish, what, what software did the students use to make those models, like those assets, or did they come from somewhere? Uh, the student actually made that as his first sort of test run in ZBrush, which is a real tough sculpting program. I was super proud of him. He made a fish in ZBrush. And like he found like a texture and put the shader on it so it's kind of reflective. He did a really great job. And that's a sculpting program that's used a lot to make game characters. Uh, it's not an easy interface, and he's really come a long way, so he's busy working on, like, he went to the Met, like, when he went there with his family, went to, the, to New York, went to the Met, made sure to get some of these Roman dudes from the front and the side, because then you're a lot, like, you can model them, though. So he came back super excited to sculpt that guy's head, and he's doing a pretty good job. 
Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the nodes, um, how important is the consistency of where exactly you're placing them in the program? It's not that, as long as it's inside the, it's not actually not important at all, except visually for you. Because as long as the node is there, the edge is there, and the direction is the way you want it to be. I mean, but they are measuring distance. No, they're no. only measuring topological relationships. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's why, to me, that, that's kind of, to me, about traditional space syntax, I didn't really like that. So I like to have the nodes like sort of centered on the node, like on the room, because then I can sort of assess both of those aspects, both the topological connections and the actual metric of the space. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in your use of um, you know this, this kind of uh, environment for learning. Um, how available? I mean, like if I wanted to bring this into my classroom, would that be possible? Yeah. And yeah, here's the, the, it's a really small downside. You have to have the Unity player, which is pretty much like the Flash player for the web. It's an e very easy install. Uh, the only thing, you have to be a little patient, because this is, I think, 120 megabytes now. It's about a four or five minute download. Okay. But once it's downloaded, you can explore it all you want. And so as far as, like, I mean, are there, like, would I be able to get, like, this house, for example? Mm -hmm. or would I have to build it Yeah, I have, there's a caveat there for me is, uh, and that is what I want to do, the game is going to happen, but this house is not right now annotated. Like, this is how we chose this, and this is how we did this, this is the actual evidence. So as long as you're aware, with the caveat, that we've done a lot of, there's a lot of this that's, that's pretty accurate. A lot of it is somewhat embellished, a lot of it's made up. And then we haven't, I haven't yet flagged those, but you can see, that's why I wanted to show you inside Unity, sort of under the hood. You can see how you script and code those kinds of flags. So we're working on that. But if you just want to see it right now, I just give you my card or something, and you can go ahead. And I don't, I don't have any proprietary relationship to it. Uh, the thing, I mean, I made it, but. <laughs> but the other thing about it is, here's the good news: is that almost none of those walls are made from like so many meticulous little pieces of photographs went into them. That almost not, there's a few that are a whole wall. Like I just took the photo chunk, and I, most of them are mine. But we can sort of sidestep a lot of copyright issues because we're not using very much of any given photo. It's really true. Sometimes there's, underneath that is a drawing. Or there's a black and white that's been partly colorized. It's been put together with a chunk of color photo. There's a lot of Photoshop technique to try to get it to happen. But you're well, I'd be happy to. Make. And are there other projects that are similar to this? That I only have two houses. Uh, I know that um, uh, there's a couple other Unity projects that have a little bit of content available. I don't think Bernie Frischer's work on Adrian's Hill is available yet. Uh, Johnny Clark, is it? What's that? The Adrian's Hill is coming out in June. In, in June. Yeah. So it's supposed you, to be April twenty first, but I guess it's delayed. Wow. Was that? Was that like? That's close to Rome's birthday, right? Yeah. Oh. They missed it. Oh. Adrian didn't quite make it. And so, <laughs> and so um, yeah, there's going to be that content. I know John Clark's been working on a Villa Pontus. I'm not sure if that'll be released or not. But there are some Unity, other Unity projects dealing with Roman antiquity. But I only have two houses available right now, because it's hard. Uh, but I'd be happy to share the links with you. Mm -hmm. Apart from coloring the spaces with photo data, did you actually draw up the 3D space in Unity, or did you need a program? No, you, Unity's not a 3D modeling okay. program like what that. We use uh, Cinema 4D for, for modeling. Uh, we part, I used it partly because it was accessible as a, for students. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty visually and the same, the same thing struck me about Unity when I first started using it. So it was all like Final Cut in terms of how it was arranged. And so it seemed intuitive to me in many ways. So I mean, it's hard, but it still was approachable. So both of those programs seemed to be more approachable when I started the project. And Cinema's paid out pretty well for us. It has a great integration with Photoshop. It's amazing. You open Cinema, you have your Photoshop document open. All of its layers are present. You can move, like that's what makes Fine positioning of these paintings possible. So you can move the little layers around and save it as Photoshop, open it back up in Photoshop. I mean, it's really seamless. Then I get all those things into Unity. I'm like, ah, it's a little screwed up. Double click on the texture in Unity, it opens Photoshop. I can edit it right there. I can double click open the Cinema model in Unity, edit it in Cinema, save it, the updates automatically. It's a real nice workflow. So, without that, the project would be really hard. Because students, they, they, they've glommed on to this. Uh, and I'm learning from them now a lot, especially on the coding side. So, yeah, we're probably going to stop to keep on getting.
But thanks very much for coming. It was fun.